Okay, um, this, uh, it's been a long day, but an educational one, but pay attention, it's the most important part, it's the vascular surgery part. <laughs> I'm not going as far to say that the heart is a vestigial organ, but this is the important part. So uh, first let me, uh, let me uh, invite our panel uh, to the uh, stage, that would be um, Dr. Byrne and Dr. Singh. Uh, my name is Shane O'Keefe, I'm uh, one of the vascular surgeons at the Medical Center here in Bowling Green. And our panel comprises of my partner, Dr. Michael Byrne, uh, who's been a tremendous influence on me over the years. Uh, tremendous surgeon, great clinician, and uh, we're glad to have him here. And Dr. Singh, who is the director of vascular medicine at the Western Kentucky uh, Heart and Mouth. Thanks for coming. And so, I'd like to introduce our speaker. I have the pleasure of introducing my friend and colleague, Dr. Matthew Courier. I've known Dr. Courier for over 14 years. Um, it's a relationship that began under the tutelage of Dr. Raoul Guzman of Vanderbilt. And during our time in Dr. Guzman's lab, we developed a mutual loathing of rats and mice, <laughs> and a love of music that was loud enough to uh, stop other people from working. <laughs> um, after extricating himself from my bad influence, he uh, finished his general surgery residency at Vanderbilt, whereupon he completed his vascular surgery fellowship at Wake Forest and received an MPH from the same institution. Um, his subsequent career has involved multiple academic postings uh, at Emory, Wake Forest, and he is now a professor of vascular surgery at the University of Michigan. His he is the author of numerous uh, publications and book chapters and is the recipient of many research grants. Um, he continues uh, to work in the vanguard of uh, medical research in this country whilst maintaining a very robust clinical practice. In fact, his research interests have transitioned from a traditional uh, basic science approach to a more patient-centered, revolutionary translational approach, which is uh, em embling, you know, which kind of is symptomatic of that uh, change in research in the United States over the last uh, 10 years or so. Um, Dr. Courier's dedication to improving the care of patients in the field of vascular surgery has always been to me a source of both professional and personal inspiration. So I'm pleased to invite him here to talk about a somewhat controversial topic of renal artery stenosis. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Matthew Courier. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I, uh, this is my first trip to uh, Bowling Green, but uh, having lived in this part of the country for uh, one of the funnest uh, and most stimulating parts of my life, it's nice to be back here, and I'd like to congratulate you on such a great turnout. It seems to be a very vibrant and interesting symposium that's relatively young, so uh, real honor to be here. Um, uh, renal artery stenosis is really controversial. I, uh, a couple years ago at our annual meeting got to debate uh, one of the PIs for the ASTRAL trial in a United States versus Europe series of debates on this topic. And as we were walking into the debate hall, uh, someone behind me I overheard saying, are we really still talking about renal artery stenosis? And uh, I recently got asked to be a technical expert on an AHRQ update of a comparative effectiveness review. And uh, it was very interesting to me because I was wondering uh, when I got the draft if it was going to be nails in the coffin. And actually, I think uh, you know it's really important when we review what we know to understand the limitations of the trials that are out there and the questions that they don't answer. And uh, my, uh, the preceding talk, uh, uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna give you a different kind of approach because we're really gonna delve a little bit into the details of, the tr of some of the trials for uh, atherosclerotic stenosis. And uh, I, I was admonished for having too many slides and I'm gonna finish on time, just give me a signal or something. I whacked a bunch of them out uh, between uh, lunch and right now. So here we go. Uh, these are my uh, disclosures. None of them are relative uh, to uh, this particular presentation. 
I'm going to mainly focus on occlusive renal artery disease in adults. I'm not talking about children. I'm not talking about uh, stent lesions, renal aneurysms, or anything else. And I really want to talk about when should revascularization be considered versus avoided. When I was finishing up my residency training and beginning my fellowship training, CMS got a committee together to look at renal artery intervention. There being an explosion of procedures, the evidence was not great, and they were looking really hard about whether they should still uh, reimburse physicians for doing renal artery interventions at all. And the, the conclusion of the comparative effectiveness review at that time, which is now 10 years old, was that av available evidence doesn't clearly support one treatment approach over another. Since this came out, we've had several randomized trials that got published. Before we get to that, I'm going to start with just a, a little bit of a historical per perspective. This is Dr. Goldblatt, and he uh, did some of the original experiments uh, in uh, dogs. He's a pathologist at Cath Case Western University, and I, I know we have some medical students here. When I was in medical school, we used to have this thing called the library, where you went and looked up these books <laughs> with journal articles in them. And this article is actually too old to get off PubMed, but I have gone and pulled it up. And it's really interesting to read. He's got all these really neat drawings of the pictures. And if you go on the website, they've actually got their Goldblatt's clamps. And he proved a uh, really elegant series of experiments that occluding uh, a dog's renal artery causes an increase, uh, you know, severe unilateral or bilateral uh, occlusion, decreases urine output increases BUN and it'll cause them to die over a period of time and it might seem intuitive based on that that undoing a chronic stenosis of a renal artery is helpful but it's, it's really not that simple. Just to touch on the pathophysiology of renal artery stenosis, you know, impaired uh, renal perfusion, Dr. Goldblatt's experiments were actually done before the renin angiotensin aldosterone system had even been discovered or characterized. He observed these ahead of that. And the early conceptual model of the pathophysiology really focused on renin, uh, aldosterone, angiotensin, and volume status. Uh, we now know that it's a whole lot more complicated than that. There's other issues including inflammation, uh, and uh, we know now that there's multiple types of angiotensin receptors, some of which are even intracellular. And so it's a lot less straightforward uh, than it seemed uh, even back when I was in medical school. And the expanded conceptual model includes all these other processes and a bunch of extra renal manifestations. And I was, I was loving uh, seeing diastolic dysfunction on this agenda because actually my master's thesis was looking at diastolic dysfunction in patients with renovascular hypertension. So, uh, it's, uh, so the pathophysiology is distinct in unilateral versus bilateral disease. And the key distinction there is that in unilateral renal, renal artery stenosis, there's a contralateral kidney that's functional. If, if that kidney has function and it's open, the contralateral kidney can uh, perform a compensatory nature resis, and so they don't get volume overloaded. And so usually when we see circumstances like flash pulmonary edema, acute hypertensive emergency, acute congestive heart failure in the setting of renal artery stenosis, it's an indicator of either bilateral disease or a, a single functioning kidney that's become critical. And that's a common question for the students that we sort of ask on tests sometimes to see if you understand the pathophysiology. Here's a couple images just to say that, you know, uh, the, the superior image is, is a, a quasi-typical lesion for atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. It's a proximal main renal artery lesion. You can see that that disease extends into the aorta. You can see scooped out areas of uh, mural thrombus within the wall of the aorta. And image B on the bottom is typical of fibromuscular dysplasia, alternating areas of stenosis and aneurysmal degeneration uh, that are diffuse and often involve the distal renal artery, including the branches. And we'll start with what we know the most about, which is atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. So atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis has an estimated prevalence of about 7% in the United States, an incidence of about four cases per thousand years. And the risk factors for renal artery stenosis, the atherosclerotic type, are the same as for cardiovascular disease in general, smoking, hypertension, other known vascular disease. And renal artery stenosis is associated with increased risk for cardiovascular events and mortality. Renal artery stenosis is often asymptomatic. It can present a secondary hypertension or impaired renal function or both. And it can also present as uh, what, what I would call a hypertensive emergency, and that's where uh, 
Uh, there's an acute hypertensive presentation that's symptomatic and often shows signs of target organ damage that's, again, acute. That can be encephalopathy, it can be a, an aortic dissection, coronary syndrome, pulmonary edemia, uh, preeclampsia, which I'll show an interesting uh, provocative study we did at Wake Forest over the past few years, renal failure or hem hemolytic anemia. <clears throat> Oftentimes, an event like general anesthesia unmasks this, and you can see ventricular remodeling and diastolic dysfunction as target organ damage in more chronic situations. This is really relevant to management because subcritical disease is common. Uh, you can have asymptomatic lesions that are frequently identified as we do non-invasive imaging approaches or do angiograms at the time of interventions for unrelated procedures. And I am going to present to you that I don't think the natural history in situations where there's not clear symptoms that we think are attributable to the renal stenosis, I don't think there's a role for treating those lesions in those situations. Uh, natural history of renal artery stenosis is hard to know because the populations that define most of the studies characterizing it are defined based on uh, diagnosed vascular disease. So we don't have good cohort studies of healthy populations apart from the cardiovascular health study to go by. They're also confusing because there's different ways they've assessed disease severity and progression, including uh, angiography or duplex, and functional assessments vary in terms of, uh, you know, in this day and age, with cross-sectional imaging, we can do 3D volumes on renal mass. In the olden days, we did things like renal length to try and figure that out. So the old studies, as I'll call them, and you can see the most recent of these is 1991. Uh, uh, those are the ones that describe the highest rates of progression. Uh, most of them are based on angiographic studies. Most of these were performed outside what I would call the modern era of cardiovascular risk reduction pharmacotherapy, which really affects risk of progression rates, and in patients who were deemed inoperable or had renal uh, dysfunction. More recent studies show lower rates of progression, anatomic progression occurring in somewhere between 8 and 31 percent of patients, conversely about 70 percent or more do not progress if they're on the right medical therapy. And among those that do progress, it's really a minority that progress to occlusion. So a common misconception is if we don't intervene on your renal artery lesion, we're going to miss an opportunity to do it later because you're going to progress to occlusion. That actually happens in a very small minority of patients. And, and the second thing I would add is that anatomic progression of disease is not equate to a symptomatic presentation. A lot of these anatomic progressions uh, identified by angiography or duplex are not accompanied by significant worsening of hypertension or loss of renal functional mass. So uh, the natural history can be benign when medical therapy is appropriate. Therefore, I mentioned prophylactic renal intervention only to condemn it. Um, it you can hurt people uh, doing renal artery interventions. There is an incidence of uh, decline in renal function after these pre procedures. And it's a flawed mentality to assume that the lesion is going to progress or that progression will cause renal dysfunction and the natural history of a stented renal artery is often worse than a native stenosis that's subcritical and left alone. I would say about 80% of the open renal surgery I do now uh, that's not for aneurysms is for stented renal arteries. I'll show you a picture of that. And so there is a downside uh, to getting too aggressive with stenting these lesions. I also want to emphasize that treatment refers to medical therapy or revascularization, but uh, again, mostly at our students. You never do medical therapy or revascularization. It's always medical therapy plus revascularization. So it's, it's, un, it's not good to think of it as an either or. And when you're contemplating a, a patient who uh, you're assessing about whether they need an intervention, the first question is always, have we gotten this patient on appropriate medical therapy, maxed it out, and what do they look like? And I'll touch on why that's important when we talk about the trials. So medical management, uh, the supporting evidence uh, for how to take care of these patients is largely derived from patients with other diagnoses and not specific to renal artery stenosis. Uh, and uh, procedural and medical management have an interplay. ACE inhibitors or angiotensin receptor blockers are the core of uh, hypertension control in this patient population. It's a common uh, misconception that we should avoid an ACE inhibitor and ARB because we're going to precipitate acute renal failure because we have a critical stenosis uh, to a, a kidney that's, that's got chronic ischemia. That's actually really uncommon. The only scenario where you're likely to do that is when you have a really critical lesion to a single functional kidney. And most of the big ACE inhibitor trials uh, 
that observed uh, events like acute renal failure were in situations where patients had gastroenteritis or some other cause of acute dehydration. So step one is always to get them on one of these medications and max it out and keep track of their renal function. Uh, it's also important to note that ACE inhibitors in this group of patients are associated with uh, event reduction, renal protection, particularly among diabetes. I don't have to tell this audience that. Uh, <clears throat> the other key component is statin therapy, uh, which, you know, again, these vascular disease, CKD, have a lot of overlap with atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis, but we reduce the risk of anatomic progression on statins, independent of the risk on uh, stroke and, and heart attack risk. And we also reduce their uh, risk of restenosis, and I'll show some of our own research related to that. <coughs> Antiplatelet medications are the third component, reduce risk of cardiovascular events, also reduction in procedure-related atheroembolism during renal angioplasty and stenting. Uh, Dr. Cooper's group showed that doing dual therapy with abciximab and clopidogrel. Um, evaluating renal artery outcomes in terms of procedural intervention is a complicated business. Uh, kidneys like legs, there's two of them, and whether one or both are dysfunctional at the start and one or both are intervened upon really affects how the outcomes, so it can get pretty sticky. It's also complicated because a lot of the trials data out there and a lot of the comparative effectiveness uh, research related to renal intervention did not standardize medical therapy, which really, really complicates how we assess this data. So as you review it, you also want to look at what the endpoints of response were and how they define the, the patient population. In terms of endovascular treatment, in studies describing improvement in, in renal function are few. Uh, so there are several that describe uh, post-intervention decline occurring with equal or greater frequency than improvement in renal function after stenting for atherosclerosis. So again, we need to be selective and, be, and uh, we, need to, uh, we need to be careful not to condone aggressive application of revascularization therapy unless it's really, really not a lot of good alternatives. Uh, the implications of post-intervention decline in renal function are really uh, serious. And I also want to emphasize as we look at the trial data in a second, a patient who goes into a renal intervention with mild hypertension and normal renal function only has potential to get worse. We're not going to make them better, so we bite off risk of renal functional impairment without any converse uh, opportunity to make them better. And that's important when we look at astral and coral in a second. Hypertension responses are also modest, to be honest with you. Cure of hypertension is rare when it's atherosclerotic disease. Most patients are characterized as improved, although lower rates of improvement have occurred as medical therapy has gotten better. So I think a lot of the older studies suggesting major benefits uh, predated some of the medications we have now. These are reported predictors of response to endovascular treatment, bilateral disease and intervention, elevated creatinine at baseline, impaired ventricular function, or rapid uh, functional decline usually assessed based on assessing the inverse of the slope of the serum creatinine over time. Uh, and the same uh, for blood pressure responses. Uh, I don't understand the female gender among those as a predictor of a good response, except that I would think that would be an indicator of FMD, although these studies were all uh, atherosclerotic. Restenosis is really common after angioplasty and stenting for renal artery occlusive disease. 17 to 44 percent incidence and the predictors are shown here. If you have a really tiny renal artery that you put a really tiny stent in, you're at pretty high risk. I'm pretty conservative about angioplasty and stenting, accessory renal arteries, even if I think they're symptomatic for that reason. Uh, smoking, statin use, and pre-op blood pressure are also predictors. At Wake Forest, we uh, did a study trying to look at risk factors for restenosis, and we were horrified at how common it was in our patient cohort of 100 patients. at 28% risk of restenosis, median interval where the restenosis was identified was less than six months after the procedure. This is based on duplex criteria uh, confirmed with angiography. Uh, it's interesting though that about two-thirds of the patients who got a restenosis didn't have a clinical manifestation of the restenosis. They did not have a deterioration of blood pressure or renal function. We tended to leave those alone. Uh, this is what the survival curve looks like and this is what it looks like stratified by statin use. So pre-op statin use in the blue no statin use in the red. You can see there's a drastic difference. I had a great conversation with Dr. O'Keefe and a couple uh, 
pharmacists that have launched, and we we're talking about QI projects. And uh, this is a really great example of uh, how quality improvement isn't really about whether you know statins prevent restenosis. Most of us would assume that, but if you're not checking how how successful you are with getting these patients on the medication, you might assume you're doing a lot better than you are. And so this 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 was the NIDAS for a quality uh, improvement uh, project at Wake Forest where we did a better job of putting these patients on these medications before their intervention so we didn't have to remember to put them on it after their intervention. Surgical management is used with decreased frequency these days because angioplasty and stenting has gotten a lower profile. We've gotten better at it. There's a lot of different techniques. Aorta renal bypass with a saphenous vein graft is probably the most common. Endarterectomy is much less common. There's not a lot of vascular surgeons around these days that know how to do it very well. An extra anatomic bypass uh, can be a useful approach to reconstruction, especially when patients have extensive aortic disease uh, or uh, have characteristics of their aorta or their wrists that, that, that are unsuitable for clamp application. Um, surgical management is not a freebie. Uh, three to eight percent perioperative mortality rate. That's high. That's, you know, one in 20 patients doesn't leave the hospital or dies within 30 days. Lots of perioperative op complication uh, risk, including pneumonia, uh, bleeding, and acute renal failure. And so we take it seriously to intervene on a patient with open surgery for renal stenosis and usually is under circumstances where we're faced where we don't have much of a good alternative these days. Renal function responses from surgery, however, are generally good. Uh, 25 to 60 percent early improvement, but up to 27 percent worsen. About 4 percent of patients require perioperative dialysis. Pre-op renal dysfunction is a big indicator of that. There are series out there reporting patients who've come off dialysis uh, uh, after renal artery bypass, but I'll emphasize that those are a minority of patients. I'll also emphasize that if you look at the older surgical literature, you can get confused because uh, a decade or two ago, a lot of these patients were being uh, evaluated very aggressively preoperatively with nuclear medicine scans and, and selective renal vein renin sampling. And if we get sloppier with how we select patients, these outcomes can't be reproduced. Hypertension responses are highly variable. Most patients categorize as improved, but cure is uncommon. And it's hard to compare these because we, we're not going to see randomized comparisons. Predictors of dialysis-free survival after surgery are uh, blood pressure cure following surgery and early creatinine improvement. We see worse outcomes after surgery for renal artery stenosis in patients who are diabetic, have an occluded renal artery, or have impaired preoperative renal function. So let's talk about a couple of the recent randomized trials. Uh, limitations of these, when you're reviewing this data, you need to know how did they select the patients, what were the indications for intervention, uh, and what was the medical management strategy, and what were the endpoints that were assessed. Uh, it's often the case within two of the studies I'm going to show you that management within the design of the trial might not mirror what we would call good clinical management in a clinic situation. Uh, so let's talk about the ASTRAL trial first. Uh, this study uh, randomized patients to medical therapy or angioplasty and stenting for atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. The inclusion criteria were uncontrolled refractory hypertension or unexplained renal dysfunction. Uh, they had to have a significant anatomic stenosis of at least one kidney artery. And this third bullet point I find very interesting. This, is, this seems like bad grammar, but this is verbatim from the paper. Doctor uncertain that the patient would definitely have a worthwhile clinical benefit from revascularization. Again, in this day and age with what we know, we almost never would go intervene on someone's renal artery when we were in this uh, sort of maybe it'll help, maybe it won't. It's more of a no option situation. You see the exclusion criteria here. The primary outcome of the study was change in renal function, and it was designed and powered to detect a 20% reduction in the slope of serum uh, creatinine inverse. So scenarios, again, getting back to what I said a minute ago, where we might anticipate change in renal function after revascularization, you can have improvement of renal function that was abnormal pre-op, or you can have abnormal or normal pre-op renal function that gets worse. And so uh, along those lines, uh, if we look at this, I don't know how well it projects, 40% of patients in this group were in the normal serum creatinine range going into the study. 
25% had a GFR greater than 50, and I would submit to you that a big chunk of the patients they put in this trial with renal function improvement as the endpoint it was powered for had normal renal function going in. As you can see here, severity of stenosis in astral, uh, about 40% of the patients in both groups had a 50 to 70% stenosis, so not necessarily the most critical <coughs> disease uh, that would be compelling. So to summarize, where are we not expected change in renal function? Stenting for hypertension with normal renal function uh, or treatment of non-critical stenosis. Astral, check, check, check. They had a substantial proportion of patients that I would, I would suggest to you didn't have a, a, an opportunity to benefit uh, in the primary endpoint based on how they, were, how they were selected. This shows the randomization and basically they had 8% of the patients uh, randomized to get a revascularization didn't get it. They had 17% uh, uh, who were uh, in the medical therapy. But they had 17 patients in the medical therapy arm cross over to revascularization, also a problem in the intention to treat analysis. And they had a 20% adverse perioperative event rate in this study. So I don't know if most of those complications were access related, but very high rates of perioperative adverse events that would be unacceptable in my hospital and I imagine yours too. So the limitations of astral were unorthodox inclusion criteria. If the provider thought the patient was likely to benefit, they should have been excluded based on the way it was stented. Non-standardized medical therapy, very important, and a lot of crossover between groups. Uh, and finally, the big chunk of patients with preserved renal function who had no, no potential to improve. What did Astral teach us? It shows us that there's not a renal function benefit to revascularization if you have normal baseline function and non-hemodynamically significant disease and that renal angioplasty and stenting can be associated with significant complication rates, which ought to be factored into a decision about intervening. The more recently published uh, CORAL study, very large study sponsored by NIH, also got at this. Uh, let's look at CORAL's inclusion criteria. Systolic hypertension while taking more than two medications or CKD. So again, you could get in with uh, renal disease or hypertension or both. Exclusion criteria are shown there. The primary endpoint for coral was late major cardiovascular or renal events that were defined based on the outcomes you see here. They defined progressive renal dysfunction based on a 30% <coughs> reduction in GFR without an attributable cause. This is all the participating centers, and I just put that up there to highlight it. It was a big study that took a long time to do. Uh, they enro started enrolling in 2005. They enrolled the last uh, participant in 2010 with all those setters, and actually in 2012 they modified the endpoint definitions uh, they, uh, by the steering committee. You can see here that there were almost 6,000 patients screened for coral, of which 547 were enrolled and randomized, and you can see here that there were a whole bunch of patients held out of coral. Uh, some declined to participate, some were withdrawn by their physician, and uh, some of them didn't meet the anatomic inclusion criteria. So a very, very, very selective trial uh, considering their screening. Again, similar to Astral, st stage three or greater CKD, half the patients. So half the patients have relatively preserved renal function. Uh, and you can see here that the outcomes, including hospitalization for CHF, progressive renal insufficiency, or renal replacement were similar between groups. Again, just like with Astral, however, please remember only half the patients had significant CKD going in. Here's the forest plot of their results, which basically the trial concluded that there was no advantage in this cohort associated with revascularization. So what did CORAL show us? Well, it was a very well-designed and executed multi-center trial. It had good follow-up. Uh, enrollment was hard. And patients treated with angioplasty and stenting had no clear benefit demonstrates, I think, how effective modern medical treatment is for most patients. Limitations were the mix of hypertension and renal function and dysfunction as inclusion criteria. And I would add that these criteria are pretty modest. If you have a diabetic patient or a patient with CHF or a host of other indications, we may have those patients on an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, a beta blocker, or a diuretic for a whole host of other reasons besides absolute control or hypertension. And I would submit to you that being on two or more antihypertensive agents isn't necessarily an indicator in this day and age of poorly controlled blood pressure. I also would add that it didn't mirror real-world real best practice. And this uh, 
trial, if you got put on their uh, standard uh, antihypertensive uh, regimen, uh, which was an ACE inhibitor or an, or an ARB uh, plus a calcium channel blocker, you went on to revascularization even if you had blood pressure control on those medications. We would, we would never do that. I think that's bad practice, but that was part of the algorithm. So once randomized, they didn't care if you normalized or not on it. So we had some of these patients that had basically reasonable control of their blood pressure in the rolling arm went on to revascularization. Majority of participants were not enrolled, I think is where the indications for renal revascularization in this day and age lie. The no options patients who either declined or were withdrawn by the physician because they were felt uh, to have non-equipoise for randomization and those progressed to dialysis dependence. Stay tuned because there's a subgroup analysis. It hasn't been published yet, but it's been presented suggesting that there was a benefit to patients in this group that had significant proteinuria and they're trying to get organized for a follow-up study to coral called corollary. I don't know if anyone's here has signed up to be involved with that. I'll also add that if you want to know more and have a really comprehensive review, this is the updated uh, AHRQ review that was actually just published last month. I was a uh, technical expert reviewer for this paper. And they basically concluded, again, we were wondering if this is going to be nails in the coffin, but it wasn't. Low strength of evidence, uh, clinically important adverse events can be common, but they, they actually concluded that we just don't have enough data, that they think there's definitely subsets of patients that benefit from revascularization, but we have trouble defining on the front end who they are. And they called for uh, additional studies that are more focused on these no-option patients. And they also commented that all the uh, non-randomized trials were not adjusted to account for these underlying differences. So this is our strength of evidence table uh, that we make the pointer look here. I would just add that most most of our evidence, even though we have uh, high quality data from randomized trials, it has to be interpreted in light of the inclusion criteria. And our 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 level of evidence, I would say, is you know. Uh, class, you know, see oftentimes when you consider the, the patient specifically. So I'm going to show you two patients I did renal revascularizations on in the last year, give you an example of who I intervene on in this day and age. This is a 54-year-old patient sent to me uh, who had a history of chronic kidney disease. This pointer work. Uh, I don't know if you can see, but um, she has two stented, uh, duplicated left renal arteries there, both with critical stenosis in them that have been intervened on a total of five times. Her right renal artery has had a previous angioplasty as occluded. She came in to see me in a creatinine of two and a half. She'd been hospitalized three times in the past year with hypertensive emergencies and had multiple repeat angioplasties. Uh, this lady was you know, headed toward a stroke or death soon and had no good options. And this patient was treated with a renal artery bypass. Uh, this is uh, uh, a dual saphenous vein graft off her infrarenal aorta to both of those branch renal arteries. Uh, she uh, now has a creatinine uh, of less than one and a half. Her edema is better and she's been out of the hospital for over a year. This lady would not have been in randomized in any randomized trial because non-revascularization, I would suggest, is just an unacceptable option if you can get her through it. This is a 76-year-old gentleman that came to see me. His creatinine, he had a single function in kidney. His creatinine uh, in his previously stented uh, only patent right renal artery, his creatinine had gone from two to four and a half over the past year, had blood pressures running consistently in the 220s. And here's an oldie but a goodie for our pharmacy people came in on minoxidil. When they're on minoxidil and they're failing, it's time to think about revascularization. And that's the level of medical therapy we need to push these patients to before we just intervene on them. I actually took him and did a renal angioplasty and stenting with distal embolic protection, and he uh, is no longer symptomatic. His creatinine has crept down a little bit, not a real significant change, but his blood pressure is controlled and he feels better. So I do think there are patients out there that are helped by these treatments. I'll also add that this patient who came to see me from West Virginia was a gunsmith and, and uh, brought hit cross, corrupt quite a stir. He made this rifle and brought it to me as a gift in my clinic, which got a lot of, we got security in my clinic. Um, <laughs> this is my son when we took it to the range and sighted it in, and it's just showing you how precise selection of the right patient can get you a good result in renal artery stenosis. <laughs> so I would say the no options patients and non atherosclerotic disease and recurrent instant stenosis are places where we don't have good data and we don't have data showing that revascularization is good or bad, we just don't know.
And it says no options, patients failing aggressive medical therapy that I think should be considered for revasc. When should renal artery revascularization be avoided? Most of the time. It's been done to a lot of people, in my opinion, that I don't think needed it. There's a lot of stents out there that are going to keep, keep me in business as someone willing to do renal bypasses probably the rest of my career, but we need to be uh, cautious and very selective. And in patients with stable renal function, it's really hard to uh, go in with a hypertension only uh, indication to do something to them unless they're having this severe hypertension on four or five medications that's putting them in the hospital. How much time do I have left? Am I out of time yet? I'll get you through FMD in one minute. <laughs> FMD is non atherosclerotic, non inflammatory. It's present among 75, uh, renal FMD among all patients with FMD is, is present in 75% of patients. The other locations you'll see are the carotid and vertebral artery. Hypertension is the most common presentation. They also present with dissection, aneurysm. It's real common for a patient to have a delay of four to nine years before getting diagnosed. Uh, it's an uncommon thing that you have to think about and screen for if you want to find it. It's got no known causes. We know it's nine to one more common among women, which leads us to think that a hormonal etiology is likely. Environmental factors like tobacco, there's been some suggestion that genetics play a role, although it's not a clear single gene kind of phenomenon, and only about 60% have an have a identifiable inheritance pattern. I did this study at Wake Forest with a medical student who used to be a midwife that came to me was interested in preeclampsia research and had this tool where she could uh, do a survey and identify uh, preeclampsia in the remote, remote past. If you ever want to look at I found this fascinating. I was laughed at by my partners when I said we were going to look at it. But among women who were, underwent renal artery intervention at our center, the odds ratio if, uh, for having preeclampsia previously in life among those who uh, had been pregnant was almost tenfold higher. Preeclampsia was super common, like 60% of them had had preeclampsia as a young woman while pregnant. And I think it's a fascinating suggestion that some kind of hormonal process early in life may activate uh, FMD later in life. Uh, classification of FMD is usually based on the imaging findings. The most common kind is medial fibroplasia. That gives you the string of beads appearance I showed you before. This is a gracious gift from my partner now, uh, Dr. Stanley, and this is old fashioned. This is from back when we used to take out pieces of renal artery. We don't do that anymore. We don't treat FMD with open surgery much anymore. Here's the criteria to suspect FMD. Young woman, uh, 35 or less with hypertension, stenosis of the renal artery without atherosclerotic risk factors, renal infarct or dissection or resistant hypertension. Catheter angiography is a gold standard. A duplex for FMD can fool you. You might see one or two abnormal things like turbulence in the absence of a strict velocity criteria that make you think there's a stenosis there. If you have high clinical suspicion in a young woman, the duplex is equivocal. I'd encourage you to get an arteriogram or a CTA to look for uh, FMD. Treatment, unlike for renal artery stenosis, we actually cure a reasonable number of people with plain angioplasty. Angioplasty alone without stenting is preferred. A big distinction between that and atherosclerotic renal artery stenosis. Post-angioplasty pressure gradient and IVUS are very useful in the setting of uh, balloon angioplasty. Make sure your technical result is adequate and stent implantation. So we can get 70% uh, cure or improvement early and the restenosis rate, as you can see, is, is significant, but at five years with only balloon angioplasty, they can actually be treated again. Uh, the contrast between FMD and atherosclerosis are shown here. Women predominate in FMD. The age of diagnosis matters. Uh, in FMD, the distal renal artery or a branch renal artery is much more common to be involved as opposed to atherosclerosis, where it's usually osteal disease and hypertension cure is more common. So in summary, there's no class one data supporting intervention, but randomized trials are highly selective and use algorithms that aren't contempor contemporary or consistent with good clinical care, in my opinion. Surgery is higher risk, but may have higher rates of renal function response. Endovascular management has become the predominant method, and hypertension responses are unpredictable. I think you should combine how bad is their clinical manifestation of disease, make sure they have a significant lesion, and assess their response to previous therapy. And very aggressive medical therapy is an absolute gate, gate they got to get through before you even think about revascularization.
So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to come and give you the talk. I'm sorry I have to ramble over time. Take any questions. The guys, the guys like minoxidil. Uh, the ladies are not crazy about minoxidil because it will turn a woman. It'll make her look like a gorilla over time because it, it'll grow hair. Uh, it'll grow hair on an orange, as my previous chief used to say. But I also think minoxidil, even though it's old-fashioned, it, it is incredibly effective, and it's something that I think. Uh, especially our younger physicians don't think of a lot in this day and age. And it's also a medication that you might have to shop around and find a pharmacy that has it on hand if you're not getting it by mail or is cheap too. Dr. Courier, uh, great presentation. Uh, two questions. One, do you think the chapters are going to close on this renal artery stenosis? Two, pressure gradient across the lesion. How defining do you think <coughs> that is to determine whether you need to fix something or not? Um, I think pressure gradient measurement is really important in FMD, and I think even on an arteriogram with FMD, you know, they have these mobile luminal uh, webs uh, that can be confusing to assess by even angiography, so I think IVUS or pressure gradient measurement is, is really important. I use a pressure gradient of uh, uh, 10 millimeters mercury across the lesion, and I, I think it's really important to get post-pressure gradient as well. But there's been uh, one prospective study looking at what IBIS adds in addition to just conventional catheter angiography, and there's actually a reasonable uh, pickup of missed lesions when arteriography is equivocal. So I think if you've got that patient that's back in the hospital for the fifth time, I don't think it's unreasonable, especially if you're thinking about FMD, uh, to take them and, and run through all those uh, uh, tests to be sure you're not missing something. I think we ought to be careful about closing the book on this. And I think in the day and age of tweets and getting abstracts mailed to you, uh, you can read conclusions of a trial like Coral or Astral and make a big incorrect assumption about what they show. And so um, I remain very uncomfortable in I would say that um, vascular, other vascular surgeons and nephrologists send me most of these patients in this day and age, and it's where our, our alternative to not looking into a revascularization is watching you go over a cliff or go on dialysis or have your next stroke, and uh, it's definitely high-risk procedures, but I think we need to be uh, really careful, and again, I think that AHRQ review I was very pleased, uh, and when I debated Dr. Uh, Hamilton from the University of London, who was one of the astral investigators, he was assigned against revascularization, but we actually came to the same conclusion, even though we were on opposite sides of the debate, is these patients are out there that will benefit. We just need to get more selective and do a better, better job of identifying who they are. Do you remember how these patients were selected in coral uh, or, uh, in terms of hemodynamic significant lesions? Uh, I think they started off saying everybody will cat, put a wire through the lesion, see what the pressure drop is, and I think they dropped it pretty early on. That's correct, and they also had a minimum blood pressure. You know, enrollment was slow, and NIH was all over their case about getting the study wrapped up, and they had blood pressure criteria on the front end. A, a, a actual blood pressure number, not just hypertension, more than two meds that they dropped because enrollment was slow. And I think that may have been a mistake, and we may have folded in all these patients that, you know, didn't really have a, a decent chance of having a benefit. But uh, my recollection was that uh, they could get screened based on a duplex or an angio, but they had to have the core lab review the angio. And I think that, that's, how they started, that's how they started out yeah. as. Um, and I think that, that was the main purpose of doing the study because Astral was flawed because it said the modest inclusion criteria. So they started off saying we're going to select that group which really has tight lesion or hemodynamic significant lesion. But now it happened. I think they started off the like first year or so they could not enroll a lot of patients and then I think they included everything like duplex. And I think um, it's also important to acknowledge that I touched on two trials. There's been some other ones, a STAR trial, the NIDR trial. I don't have enough time to go into them, but these limitations and evaluating the endpoints in comparison with the inclusion criteria are very, very important before you draw a conclusion from what it shows. Uh, that was a great talk, Matt. And um, you know, most of medicine is is if you want to simplify it, we're we're driven by the golden rule, right? To do unto others what we want done to ourselves, and
This may be a good example of the silver rule. Has anyone ever heard of the silver rule? So the silver rule says, don't do unto others what you wouldn't know what done to them. So I think what we're seeing is this backlash, or not a backlash, but an investigation and honest appraisal as best we can that renal artery stenting in general has been overused. And I can remember when, when I first started medicine, surgery was the only option for renal artery stenosis. And we actually used to look to Dr. Dean at Wake Forest as our best person for guidance. And honestly, he didn't even give good guidance. You, you try to pin him down, well, when would you, you know, he, and people that worked there at, during his heyday said he just would look at the films on the surgery conference and says, oh yeah, fix this one. And, but it wasn't always clear why you fixed it. But anyways, I think you're right. There's never going to be a blind, double-blind study whether you should step in front of an 18-wheeler and be killed or not. We know intuitively if you step in front of an 18-wheeler, you'll be killed. And, and maybe we'll never do a study that if someone comes in with one occluded renal artery and a 12 centimeter, 90% stenosis with high blood pressure and a creatinine of three, that you should not do something. I think intuitively, in fact, the author, I would challenge the authors of Astral or Coral, would they themselves not you know, decline any therapy for the renal artery stenosis. Well, I don't know the gold or if it's whether it's gold or silver or what. But <laughs> when Med, MedCAC's making committees, if they quit paying for it, we'll quit doing it. They won't let right. let us do it right. anymore. And I think it was very important when we had this debate. Actually, Bob Zwolak got up and begged them to publish it. And I, for those of you who don't know, who Bob Zwolak is he's our he's vascular surgery's main uh, interaction with. Uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, CMS, who define reimbursement and all these things. He's saying, I really want to emphasize we need to publish this debate, and I'm really pleased at what the AHRQ review found, because I, I can tell you that I was pretty sure they were just going to put a moratorium on doing any kind of renal intervention. And believe me, it's been overdone. There's a lot of patients walking around stinted renal arteries that would have been, been better off left alone, but I hope we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater for these patients that really don't have a good alternative other than dying from complications of this disease.